Hello and uh, welcome to our garden in central Portugal. Uh, the plum trees are out, and I've got a few bulbs, only a few because it's our, our second year, and some old camellias are just going over with those rather over the top pinky red flowers. So that's the backdrop for today's vlog, which is about bulbs. So today uh, we're going to be talking about bulbs and of course rather wonderful uh, clump of uh, Narcissus next to me. Um, for some reason people tend to call uh, daffodils that are not the normal big trumpety ones Narcissus. In actual fact uh, they're all Narcissus because that's the, the Latin name for the, for, for the genus and there's a tendency really you know, they're all they're all daffodils. Um, these are multi-headed and they have the most fabulous scent. Um, they're a reminder that there are many many different kinds of daffodils beyond uh, the great big yellow ones we see generally. Um, there are around about 50 or so different species and uh, over the years there's been an unbelievable 22,000 hybrids raised. Of course only a few hundred of these are available commercially um, but the great thing about nearly all daffodils is that they just go on and on and on. You plant them and uh, years later they're still there and indeed as we can see from these uh, very often every year we get more so they are a really good bargain. So as I said there are many many different kinds of daffodils and uh, daffodil growers have uh, divided them up into various sections called divisions to help us make sense of all these different kinds. The ones we were looking at before which were multi-headed and very fragrant uh, they're called Tazetta daffodils uh, and their, their origins are species from mostly from the eastern Mediterranean so that means they do like quite a nice warm position in the garden uh, but in my uh, last garden in England we did very well with them and I expect we'll do even better here in Portugal. Wow. Now <coughs> uh, one of the other one of my other favorite groups of daffodils uh, are the so-called cyclamineous ones which are derived from a, a species from Spain and Portugal called Narcissus cyclamineus because uh, the perianth the petals and sepals at the back are all reflexed a little bit like a cyclamen. So we always think they look kind of surprised or their petals are being blown back by the wind. And their great thing about them is that they're relatively small which means they fit into a lot of different garden situations and they're very early uh, and they're very tough. Their disadvantage is no scent whatsoever. So the, the daffodils we're mostly familiar with are the big chaps, kind of 40, even 50 centimetres. But uh, there's increasing interest in smaller ones because people have smaller gardens or they want to grow them in window boxes or containers. Uh, and so a lot of the breeding now is going towards smaller varieties. Uh, now the ultimate success here has been a variety called Narcissus tet a tet which is this little one here which is like a sort of perfect traditional daffodil but in miniature. Now Tete Tete now sells, there are millions produced every year mostly in Holland. Uh, the story begins in the late 1940s when a fruit grower from the Scilly Isles, which has always been a traditional centre of daffodil growing, a man called Alec Gray went to Spain and Portugal uh, collecting seed of wild daffodils which must have been a pretty brave thing to do because conditions then in those countries were very very primitive and Spain of course was just coming out of a vicious civil war. Anyway he came back with his seed and he made various crosses and from one seed pod he collected just three seed. Each one of those has gone on to become a really good daffodil tete a tete becoming the most commercially successful. Uh, but it took many many years because there's no fast way and there still is no fast way to go from one original plant to the thousands or the tens of thousands that are needed to effectively launch a variety commercially.
Yep. Of course, the great thing about bulbs is you can go down the garden centre, or order on, or online in the autumn, and you get these packets of these nice, neat, dry things, and you pop them in the ground, and the next spring they're there. It's about as near to instant gardening as you can get. Uh, but it's really what happens in the year or the years after that that I think are really what sort out the bulbs that are the really good long-term garden residents like the daffodils from those that aren't. And amongst those that aren't we have to, let's face it, talk about tulips. Now everyone loves tulips and unlike daffodils they come in a very wide range of colours, uh, there's many more, much more variation and they are so wonderful as an instant source of colour and often some rather wonderful colours in the spring garden. But will they flower again next year? Quite often they don't. Tulips are really quite a different beast. Uh, tulips are mostly from the Middle East and Central Asia where spring is very very short, they grow very quickly and uh, they need, for one thing, they need a good summer baking on the bulbs, hot summer to, to allow the bulbs to form buds for next year. The other thing about tulips is they mostly reproduce by seed, whereas daffodils, as we can see, they form little bulbs on the side each year and so the clump gets steadily bigger. So they, they behave in really quite different ways. Uh, so tulips, unlike daffodils, are so much more unpredictable. Uh, some varieties come back up again next year, others don't. Um, amongst the more reliable ones are the so-called species tulips, and these are the original wild species from which all the big garden hybrids are developed. Uh, this is uh, Tulipa kalkafsiana, uh, named after a Russian botanist, and like many of them it comes from Central Asia which has a very extreme continental climate, very cold winters and very hot summers. Now my grandson I planted these the autumn before last, and last spring they didn't flower. But this year they have, um, and some other ones over there I think they're going to flower this year as well. So you know, they are a little bit unpredictable, but a lot of people reckon these little wild species tulips are in the long run more, more reliable, especially on rockeries and places where there isn't very much uh, vegetation that will shade the bulbs and compete with them during for the, for the summer. Uh, with bulbs, uh, an awful lot comes down to where they're from. So tulips then from uh, a, a, a relatively extreme climate compared to the British Isles, whereas most daffodils are from the western Mediterranean at Spain, Portugal, Morocco, Algeria, where it's a more extreme climate but winters are pretty mild and there's quite a lot of rainfall in the winter. So the daffodils can make the most of quite a long growing season uh, and in the British Isles and other countries of northern Europe, they have again those good conditions, that, that long winter where the roots can grow even before the shoots above appear above the surface, and a nice long spring. And so daffodils just do incredibly well in, in our climate. Uh, so amongst other bulbs, uh, you know, so much depends on their natural habitat. Uh, looking at uh, muscari, uh, grape hyacinths. Uh, these are again Mediterranean plants, uh, but they are they seem to be very well adapted to growing in cool conditions through the winter, often producing their leaves in late autumn so they can photosynthesize through the winter and then flower and seed in spring before the summer gets too hot. And <coughs> they are for the most part very good garden plants. Uh, I've probably got I reckon I've probably got three times as many in flower this year as I had last year. That's simply from the bulbs dividing and producing more bulbs. But they also seed and I think probably uh, if I looked carefully enough I might be able to find some little seedlings down here, uh, or certainly if not this year then, then, then next year. And in fact they are so successful at spreading that since some gardeners uh, regard them as a bit of a pest because this uh, foliage can lie flat and and squash other plants, but if you want really good, reliable uh, repeat flowering, then uh, the muscari, the grape hyacinths, are really good. Okay. Uh, so tulips, 
unlike daffodils, are so much more unpredictable. Uh, some varieties come back up again next year, others don't. Um, amongst the more reliable ones are the so-called species tulips, and these are the original wild species from which all the big garden hybrids are developed. Uh, this is uh, Tulipa kalkafsiana, uh, named after a Russian botanist, and like many of them it comes from Central Asia which has a very extreme continental climate, very cold winters and very hot summers. Now my grandson I planted these the autumn before last, and last spring they didn't flower. This year they have, um, and some other ones over there I think they're going to flower this year as well. So you know, they are a little bit unpredictable, but a lot of people reckon these little wild species tulips are in the long run more, more reliable, especially on rockeries and places where there isn't very much uh, vegetation that will shade the bulbs and compete with them. So there we are, the bulbs we've got in the garden this spring. Next spring there'll be a lot more. But of course, if you like bulbs, it does make you into a very organised gardener, because in the autumn, you can own, when we plant bulbs, we can only imagine and fantasise what it's going to be like next spring. And in spring, if we want to add more bulbs, generally, we have to wait until the autumn. So in spring, it's really important that you make notes and take photographs of where your bulbs are so you don't plant others on top. And also to look at catalogues, go online, research, make notes about what you'd like to get so that in August, when it comes around to ordering those bulbs again, you know what you want and where you're going to put them.